Um, if you just missed Seb Schmoller's inspirational talk, you have to watch it afterwards. And it reminds me to say something that goes unsaid most of the time, which is that the reason why we're in this business, at least some of us, maybe all of us, is that it seems clear now, 50 years after the idea of using technology for learning was born, seems clear now that our best hope for transforming education, making the world a more educated place, is the use of technology. And so I want to focus my remarks on research in the field of technology enhanced learning. And I want to do it in a full shared knowledge of the fact that the best I'm going to do is cherry pick a few examples of research that I'm familiar with, with no pretense whatsoever for completeness. I'm acutely aware I went, I left the banquet last night early because I had flooding into my mind all the things I'm not going to be able to say. Um, and I ask you to take what I say with that uh, constraint that I'm going to place on the territory of research in technology enhanced learning a few landmarks that will start or continue an already existing discussion. And I'm going to start, I have the words of Sarah ringing in my ears when she phoned me up last week. She said, now don't just tell us things that we can go away and read afterwards. So I'm going to start by telling you a few things that you can go and read about afterwards. Um, this slide on the screen now is for me to remind me to tell you a few things. It's not expected. I used to be a teacher and I know that you can't have this many words on a slide. But um, the Technology Enhanced Learning Research Program has just come into its final lap. I wonder how many Olympic metaphors I'm going to manage to squeeze into one talk. Uh, we're on the final straight. It closes in December the 31st and it has consisted of a rough and exciting journey of researchers in the computing sciences, researchers in the learning sciences, more than 150 researchers, more than 30 universities, industrial partners, teachers, practitioners, lecturers. It's a long story and I don't intend to tell it here. But what I would like to do is to just give a pointer to a document that has just recently been produced, and I know that many of you have taken a copy of this as you registered for this conference. Uh, we called it System Upgrade. I don't know if precious twee titles like that uh, are a good idea, but that's what we called it. And it's a, here's a, a list of the contributors, which you can feast your eyes on as I'm speaking, but just say thank you to them. The point being this, at the core of the Technology Enhanced Learning Research Program were eight very well-funded projects that spanned between two and four years each. And the question that's kept me awake at nights is, okay, clearly if you have a project that is well-funded, for the duration of that project, two things follow. One is everybody involved will do as good a job as they can because their careers depend on it. And secondly, somebody's got to worry about the big ideas of which the individual research project is an instance. What's the class that the project is an instance of? And what I want to do today is just give you a taster of some of the organizing ideas. Here are a dozen organizing ideas which I don't, you don't need to memorize. There won't be an assessment on this at the end of the lecture. But you need, we need to get some sense uh, of what the big ideas are. And here's the reason. Um, Seb reminded us what an instant of human history tool making uh, human beings have been. Well, borrowing that idea, it is a fantastically short time since anybody had the idea of using technology for learning. Um, an instant in history. 80 years after the invention of the printing press, still the only thing that was being published was the Bible. And we're in that sort of biblical era. Um, so 
w without meaning to in any way detract from the fantastic work that's been on display in this conference, out in the sustainably real world, the impact of technology is only just beginning. And Seb was right. There isn't going to be a tipping point where one day everything was normal and the next day something special will happen that will change everybody's life. It will be an incremental uh, effect. So I want to point out a few of the research issues that have struck me as important over the life of the TEL research program. And as I said before, to place a few landmarks on the landscape, not to map the territory. Mapping the territory is far too much for one lecture. So one of the things that's clearly uh, striking is the power of personal devices. And here's an example, the Personal Inquiry Project that was run by Mike Sharples and Eileen Scanlon. Recognizing that these machines that everybody enters into their educational lives with in their pockets are much more than devices for uh, engaging in Facebook. So, you know, your mobile phone has an accelerometer in it. Why can't, that, why can't that accelerometer be harnessed to teach people something about the motion of, of objects? And I'm going to give you a global advertisement now, otherwise I'm going to have to keep doing it. I'm going to tell you so little about each project, and I'm going to shortchange my colleagues who did the work in those projects so badly that you will have no alternative but to visit the website and find out more and increase our hit rate. Um, but one of the issues that I think arises from their project and arises from all of, for all of us now is how do personal consumer devices actually change the relationship between informal and informal learning? There's a huge wave now. I've just been at a conference that was dominated by Americans now. They know the answer. The answer is BYOD, bring your own device. Fantastic. Everybody has the machines in their pocket. There's wireless connectivity everywhere. There's an app for everything. There are 600,000 apps, so that must be 600,000 times as good as just having one app. And it's just terrific because the schools and colleges and universities don't even have to buy technology anymore. And you don't have to be cynic as cynical as me to realize that there's a flaw in that argument. So on the one hand, the flaw, the flaw is simple. You know, bits of technology don't change the world by themselves. People use technologies in, which, in ways which are more or less world-changing. But there is a germ of truth. The, the idea that you could sit on a train and guarantee that every other person has an iPad, or, sorry, iPad-like device, uh, is incredibly short time. I mean, it didn't seem to be like that two years ago, or even one year ago. So something has changed. And what we really have to explore, and we have very, very few answers about this, we have to explore what the relationship, what, how formal uh, learning will change as a result of the informal interactions that are taking place between all of us using very cheap, very effective, very simple devices. And we also have to ask ourselves the question, is that simplicity a single-edged sword, or is it a double-edged sword? Because there is a sense, I mean, I've got an iPad like everybody else, I love it, and I um, protect it from anybody else touching it and all those things. But, you know, it, there is a dangerous lesson for us as educators if we really think that a device with a, with a system of things that you point with your finger uh, is going to change our relationship to knowledge and to learning. Picking up on that theme, I think that probably the most important and most researched area, and still to be researched area, is the area of collaboration. I think that we see from the alacrity with which the whole world has embraced devices which bring people closer together, that collaboration really is 
one of the world-changing ideas and devices that support us in what we appear to want to do as, as human beings are clearly important for our own emotional and social development and they're probably good for our cognitive development as well. And in the SynergyNet program pro project, one of the central ideas was to ask, if we have huge iPads and little children exploring the world on, the, on that big iPad-like table, what will that do, not for their learning about arithmetic or history or whatever, but what will it do about their way of thinking together and about who can collaborate what in a team? I don't want to go down the teamwork is the 21st century skill and we have to teach everybody how to do teamwork so that we could compete with the Americans and the Chinese. Uh, that road lies madness. But I think it is true that harnessing the collaborative potential of technology, which has become a real possibility now in a way in which it, could, it was only a dream 10 or 15 years ago, is something that we clearly need to research um, more avidly. It's a good example of how I make the point and then realize that I had a slide that told me to make that point, but never mind. Um, one of the interesting projects in the TEL program was the HAPTEL project, which I can tell you the short version that they tell about themselves, but it's much more exciting than that. So the short version is, we've dreamed up this fantastic virtual reality system so that people, stu dental students can learn how to drill teeth without, use it, without inflicting pain on real people first. Um, which so far, so good. But actually it's a much more interesting project than that because it raises really fundamental question. And the fundamental question is this, the interactions that we have with machines, really we've learned are very, very critical in generating cognitive and emotion emotional advance. Who could have predicted that the difference between poking at a screen with a stylus and poking at a screen with your finger, which is clearly a stupid thing to do, I mean look at the size of your finger, but it has made a difference hasn't it? I'm not saying which is better, but it's made a difference and certainly poking at a screen with your finger is a very different activity than typing on a keyboard, especially a keyboard which was designed 200 years ago to stop the keys sticking, which is why the, the letters are put in such an unlearnable relationship to each other. So finding out how these different modalities, and obviously I'm not a, a future gazer, but it's obvious that the range of modalities with which we will interact with technology is going to increase at an alarming rate, reading our eye movements and gestures and so on. There's already signs of that there. Let's not go down the future will be great um, road. Um, one of the most important and least researched areas of technology enhanced learning is how to support the most important element in the learning process. And I think the most important element in the learning process now and throughout the lifetime of everybody in this room and probably everybody in this room's grandchildren too will be the teacher. I don't rule out the possibility that one day the computer will be able to do what a brilliant teacher does but I do rule it out in our lifetimes and the next generation's lifetime as well. So it's very welcome that Diana Lorillard's project which is called Learning Designer is a project about supporting teachers to be the professionals and lesson designers that they want to be. And one of the points I think she and her really interdisciplinary team makes very forcibly is that if you consider the kinds of things that professionals have at their disposal, the software that architects use, the machines that medics use, Almost everywhere that you look, the kinds of things that engineers need, the, the way that music has been transformed by technology. If you look at those kind of technologies and say, and what is the technology, what is the rich set of tools that a teacher can use to enhance his or her productivity and his or her professionalism and his or her 
role as a designer of learning experiences for their, ch for their students? The answer is not that much. Um, we all know what tools are available. But many of those tools do a great job at recapitulating with technology what you would do anyway. And there's nothing wrong with that. If technology can make life easier in those simple ways, then so be it. But what Diana puts very forcibly is the potential of having a machine that makes sense of what the teacher is doing in designing new courses or new lectures or new lessons that understands the teacher's point of view that says, well, actually, not just, you know, people who have used that lesson have also used that lesson. That's not difficult to do. But to say, well, if that's the way you're looking at your lesson, then you might like to think about what implications that has for learning and teaching. And you may like to be connected with people who are doing it, but also with things to read and videos to watch and things to do that will make you think more deeply about it. I think building tailor-made professional toolkits, semantic tool sets, tool sets that understand each other and, and what the humans are doing with those tools are an important lesson. And I think finally, almost finally, in this section of my talk, but you never know because you have to be watching so many screens at once here, it's too difficult. Um, I think that for me, there are two questions that are overarching with technology and learning. One that I haven't said that much about yet, but I'm going to devote the whole second part of my talk to, which is how does the what of learning change with technology that is designed innovatively and, and in a revolutionary way? But the other question is who can learn that couldn't, be le couldn't learn before? Um, the Interlife project focuses on a very interesting area of emotional computing, something that we're going to see far more of. Using Second Life as a way for disadvantaged people to interact with each other to, to help them overcome difficult transitions in their lives. That's a really powerful, difficult challenge. We're not very good yet at having computers that help us with the emotional side of our existence. But of course, we all know that the emotional side is crucial if we want people to learn. And reciprocally, learning and knowledge is a very powerful way to help people with emotional difficulties. And the ECHOES project too, great project for, one, for the following reason. If you consider autistic children, and you realize that the difficulty with autistic children, that the autistic children have, is that they, can't, they don't have a sense of other. They tend not to have a sense of other. By the way, here's the standard disclaimer. Autism is a huge spectrum. You haven't either got it or you haven't got it. It's not a disease. Um, forgive me if time constraints make me talk in a shorthand that is sometimes a little dangerous. But the interesting thing, the ECHOES project built an artificially intelligent little uh, agent, there's Andy on the bottom left-hand corner, who responds in very predictable ways to what the human user is doing. Uh, eye trackers and gestures and all kinds of things. Details suppressed, you can find them yourself. But interesting, two interesting things, one is that whenever you study an extreme of human behavior, it's telling you something about the norm. I should have put the adjective so-called in front of extreme and norm. And everybody, to a greater or lesser degree, has to face the challenge of how to interact and understand what it means to interact with other human beings. And so some of the teachers that are using the ECHO system are reporting very interesting things happening with children who are not apparently on the um, uh, autistic spectrum. Because, and here's the second interesting thing about technology, if you build a system 
you have to build a formal system. It has to do the right thing at the right time. And it has to do it for everybody. So I think we're going to see uh, artificial intelligence techniques for emotional engagement as an area of research, which is really only just getting underway. It's amazing when you consider artificial intelligence is about 60 years old. Um, it's amazing how little that has permeate, permeated into ordinary teaching and learning. Well, it isn't amazing, really. It's tough stuff. And it's asking some of the most difficult questions of all. And of course, the ultimate holy grail of artificial intelligence, I suppose, which is, can you make a machine do what human beings do, is completely impossible because we have no idea how human beings do what they do anyway. We, can, we, can, we know how human beings do trivial things like playing chess, but not how they stand up and walk through a door that's closed and so on, how they open a door. And these are really difficult things. The things that Marvin Minsky said, the things that we've forgotten how we learned are the things that are most difficult to teach. Okay. You've read that? This, is the, this really is the last project of this part of the talk that I'm going to do on to, to, to talk about. But Ensemble is a very interesting project because it's using the semantic web in, in interesting and powerful ways. So it's saying um, we have a pedagogy that we would like to employ. In their case, they've chosen case-based learning, immersing students in what it means to design a dance, choreograph a dance, or to steer ships into harbors, a fantastic array of, of interesting things that they've worked on. And the issue is, can we encourage the students to build using semantic web tools to create their own visions and their own representations and their own collaborative objects with which to learn. And I think, that's enough of the detail, I think that we really are, we really are seeing now the change, the, the second big change that's happened with the web from the first role of the web as just a huge library to the second phase of the web as a, as a social milieu. And now this third phase that we're entering, that people are working very hard on, still huge research challenges as a place to reuse data, to remix data, to bring disparate sources of data together and create uh, from, from, from the data that exists in huge quantities and to make sense of it. In a word, in a sentence, to turn information into knowledge. Right, well, that's, that reminds me what comes next. Um, I don't know how many of you got, went to the Hockney exhibition in London, but I had this really, and uh, by the way, I then found out that hundreds and thousands of people had the same realization, so it wasn't just as I was so brilliant, but you go into this exhibition and some beautiful paintings by Hockney, and then there's this huge room with about 100 pictures. And I had this, uh, I knew something was wrong. I, I, by the way, I'm, I live a very sheltered life. I'm training to be a high court judge, so I don't listen to the radio or watch television or read newspapers. Um, so I should have done that first, and then I would have known what I was going to face. But what, I, what, you actually ha what actually happens to you is that you stand in front of a painting, here's one, probably breaching all copyright, um, uh, and you think, there's something different about this. And you, you know, is it better, is it worse? Is it, is it, he's got new paintbrushes. Well, you know the ending of the story now because this was a year ago and everybody's been talking about it nonstop. Um, he did all these paintings on an iPad. And I don't know the first thing about watercolor uh, or even any kind of painting. But I think that what Hockney says is a really interesting metaphor for us. He says there are gains and losses. There are things that you miss. There are things that you gain. There are things that you can do with the technology. With, no, sorry, let me start that sentence again. There are things you can do with this technology 
that you do differently with that technology. Let's not forget that paintbrushes were invented and they represented a very powerful technology for their time, which hasn't ended either. So I want to spend the rest of my talk... What time do I stop? Oh, good. Um, I want to spend the rest of my talk talking about the ways that meaning, knowledge, stuff to know is potentially transformed by technology. Um, and to explore in both directions how the tools shape, if not determine, but certainly shape the knowledge at stake and how evolving knowledge also shapes the tools that we use because we use tools in different ways depending on what we know, what we think and what we feel and who we're collaborating with. And I want to start with an example that struck me very forcibly a few years ago. So forgive me, you may have seen it before, but it's just so stunning that I, have, I can't resist it. Uh, just after the first banking crisis, when Lehman Brothers went belly up, uh, Goldman Sachs, the chief financial accountant of Goldman Sachs, plaintively gave an interview to somebody, I think, from CNN. And he said, we were seeing things that were 25 standard deviations from the mean, several days in a row. Now, I don't want this to develop into a maths lesson, but this is what he meant. Here's the normal distribution. It's chopped up into six, three on each side, standard deviations. And all you need to know is that by the time you get to the third standard deviation, you've nearly picked up the whole lot, 99.7%. By the time you've got 10 standard deviations, it's 99.99999 for a very long time. And by the time you're at 25 standard deviations, it's worth asking, what sort of a number is that? Any, any guesses? Roughly, sort of, you know, a few trillion? It actually turns out to be 6 times 10 to the power of 124 times the life of the universe so far. And this guy says, we were seeing it three days in a row and something must have been a bit odd, right? Now, why am I telling you this story? By the way, somebody went, I, I was told this uh, as an audience earlier in the year, and somebody said, oh, but he must have known. The chief financial accountant of Goldman Sachs must know that the normal distribution is the wrong way to look at a problem like this. And you know what? They're probably right, and that makes it worse. Because if that's true, he must have been confident that nobody would notice. And really, my whole objective here is to say, we should notice. These are the things that we need to teach people. Um, the knowledge that powers the world is less and less visible. You know, so when I was a little boy, I used to take my dad's watch to pieces, and I think I learned something about, well, something about something, cogs and wheels and things like that. You take our watches apart, most of us here, there's nothing to see at all. You take all those devices that you're tweeting, I, I wish I hadn't said that. I, I've got to face the Twitter feed when I finish, I suppose. Um, but you take any of those devices to pieces, what the hell do you see? Nothing. A circuit board, if you're lucky, even less. So this is a very, very difficult conundrum for us all. The world is powered by these devices increasingly that we can't easily get access to. That's why we need formal education, by the way. I'm not a de-schooler. De um, I don't care how clever the technology gets and how much MIT opens its open source stuff to people. You need an inspired teacher to help you understand the things that are really difficult to bump into by yourself. I'm going to give you an example of what I mean, which is not, doesn't come from anywhere near the Technology Enhanced Learning Research Program. Uh, 
but it's, it speaks to me as a mathematician because all my life I've been trying to find ways to share with people the joy of what it means to think mathematically, uh, knowing full well that it's a lost cause. <laughs> <laughs> and I've lost track of the number of times, you know, you see, see somebody at a party and they, they seem pretty normal and happy to talk to you for a few minutes and then the dreaded moment comes and you say, what do you do? I used to say I was a professor of mass education, There's always this, they always say two things, I either say, oh you must be so clever, which is almost as bad as, oh I was never any good at maths at my school, with a little laugh that shows that actually they're quite proud of not being very good at maths at their school. But joking apart, the, the joy of what I'm going to show you isn't anything really to do with the mathematics, but of bringing alive experience. So here's a flock of birds and nobody, it should be a video but I couldn't, do, couldn't find one, nobody who's ever seen a flock of birds do this, which is everybody, right? Um, could have avoided asking themselves, how do they know where to go? And you know, the fluidity of the flock and the, is there one at the front and, and what happens when they meet a cloud and all those things, right? So I thought, well, this, th wouldn't this be fantastic? And here comes the major problem, not just with teaching mathematics, but teaching in general, which is if you want authenticity, it seems like it authenticity goes with complexity. And if you need complexity, you immediately rule out understanding by ordinary people who may not want to engage at a very deep level over a very long amount of time. So I thought, what is the answer to this conundrum of how the birds know where to go? And I'm in a happy position now to share with you the answer. Okay. Okay, this really is the set of differential equations uh, that will tell you. And I have met a collaborator of the man who's cited on this page who vouches for the fact that he can tell me exactly what it means. And I have to tell you that I don't have the slightest idea what it means. Um, mathematics is a fantastically compartmentalized subject like every other one. And I only have the slightest notion what it means. But um, if I had the right technology, this is where we probably find out that my... Oh, great. My I, just, I think I should share with you that both my screens have gone blank. Um, is there anybody here who can help? Um, Oh, fantastic. Okay, sorry about that. The great thing about technology is it's so liberating, isn't it? Um, I'm going to populate this screen with 300 little birds, randomly placed. I'm going to say, go. And off they go, random directions, but then there's something samey about all the directions and clumpy. Samey and clumpy. Okay, I don't... It doesn't matter what this was written in, it was written in NetLogo. It doesn't matter what the p particular rules are. You've all seen simulations of this kind. But the important idea here is that the only thing a bird needs to know is where's its nearest neighbor and which direction is th that bird going in. Trust me, it's roughly true. But there is one other thing that's really important about this simulation is that because it's written in NetLogo, it is a relatively simple matter to reprogram it for yourself. And I've seen very young children and I've seen university um, students reprogramming a simulation like this. So this is an example of how we can begin to rise to the challenge of making visible the mechanism. If I had to have a slogan for what I'm going to say next, it's make the mechanism make the mechanism visible. Um, I almost feel like it's a kind of like going around the world uncovering stones 
and then trying to make artifacts from what you see so that the thing that makes the phenomenon tick becomes accessible, becomes shareable. You know, the best way to collaborate with somebody is to have an object to collaborate with. And if you can look inside that object and share how it works and see some representation of how it works, then so much the better. I'm just going to say a few words about a strand of research that I've been involved in for 15 years now. And in the, with the blue background are some of the um, work groups that I've been involved with, most notably some really fascinating work with nurses about 15 years ago with airline pilots. I tell you, if you look at some of the raw transcripts of our interview data with pilots, you will never fly again. Uh, engineers and most recently some fascinating stuff with car workers and people in call centers. Oh, right, I've got 10 minutes. Um, call centers, finances. We had very interesting interviews with people working in, in uh, the pension department of a big company and we thought we'd ask them some elementary questions and we, one of the questions we asked them was if you pay um, half a percent per month, what's that equivalent to per year? And we had a cunning plan. We thought, if we start with a simple question like that, and they'll all say six, after all, you know, anybody can multiply 12 by a half. And then we can say, aha, what you've forgotten about is the compounding effect of interest. And we discovered an amazing thing. We discovered that almost everybody we interacted with had no idea that there was any relationship between monthly and annual interest in the first place. It was almost as if it w they did their job perfectly well, but they did their job by pulling down data on a spreadsheet. And you will have noticed that the latest version of Excel for the Macintosh, maybe it's true for Windows as well, does not by default give you the formula bar. Did you, have, have you come across that interesting thing? So a wonderful example of this fantastically powerful engine which deliberately, thank you Bill Gates, deliberately sets out to make invisible the most important part of the spreadsheet. Well, I'm going to have to zip through the rest and come to a conclusion. But it was almost what we found in one workplace after another is people doing their job extremely well I, I don't want to be interpreted as saying we went out into the field with a microphone and found all these stupid people. Not at all. But what we did find is that numbers were just like labels. So it's as if a number nine bus like this one here was twice the was half the size of a number eighteen bus. What a silly idea. Uh, shameless advertising, cast a veil over that. But I'll tell you the last thing on this subject, which is this is incredibly dangerous. Not having a sense of mechanism for number is a real challenge of our time. And here is Peter Hitchens in, on the Climate Change Denier website saying, all existing scientific data are suppositions, allegations and predictions. Numbers prove nothing. That is a spine-chilling thing to say. Uh, and I think that the, I'm using the number example really as a kind of uh, epitome of the problem. That if you don't have a sense of how things work, in this case how numbers work, people can say the most outrageous things to you and you just, you know, it's like saying the world was created in six days, 4,000 years ago, whatever it is the, the um, creationists say currently. And you say, well, that's a point of view. Numbers prove nothing. OK, systems are read only. The missing piece of knowledge is how things work. This can all go. And I'll keep Think Sarah the happy. Projects, Honestly, uh, I'll stop for just two minutes. And I just want to give you the last example, which is a project that I was personally involved in as part of the TEL program. And we had this sense, I suppose, of the same idea. The most important mathematical idea that we try to teach kids 
and adults, and I've taught at university too, and I, I promise you there is no level of, this, of the education uh, sector which is immune for this. The most important thing we try to teach is a mathematical way of thinking. So the understanding that if you say something is true for all cases, then it's not enough to show that it's only true for four, the first four. This is a kind of algebraic way of thinking. And yet what we do in schools and colleges is we teach, well, we teach the notes without teaching the tune. We say, here's how you manipulate algebraic expressions. And we think that from doing that, the general idea of just what a fantastically powerful tool algebra is will emerge. And I think we do it in lots of different subjects. And I ask you just for yourself, because I haven't got any time, to think of uh, analogies in, in your own specialism. But really what we were saying is algebra is not a good way to learn algebra. Um, in other words, algebra thought of as a way of thinking about the world and algebra as a, as a way of manipulating statements are not the same thing. I'm being f really fiercely glared at now, so I'm going to have to Build new representations for existing knowledge. Okay, well, I've sort of said that. I'm stopping. Okay, so tell research who needs it. We have to confront reality at this conference. You confronted reality by staying here so long. Thank you for that. The reality is the circumstances, rationales, and the representations for learning have changed. We cannot afford to just borrow technologies that existed in the past and pedagogies that fit with those technologies, we have to confront that reality. Thank you very much.